Welcome to those <laughs> it always does. who have managed to cross the security gauntlet and, and enter this building. Welcome to those who will be late because there is security here and to those <coughs> who will watch this streaming or in some other form. Uh, but we're delighted that you're here. I'm Jane Harmon, uh, the uh, president and CEO of the Wilson Center and delighted to uh, head this uh, extraordinary institution. There have been a head spinning, these have been a head spinning couple of weeks for U.S. foreign policy. The date has now been set for the historic summit with North Korea. Israel and, Haran, and Iran have confronted one another in Syria and on the Golan Heights. The U.S. has formally withdrawn from the Iran nuclear agreement. And earlier this week, um, the U.S. Embassy was relocated temporarily to uh, the uh, site of the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem, and the worst Israeli-Palestinian uh, confrontation since the 2014, uh, 2014 Hamas-Israel uh, uh, confrontation occurred along the border uh, with, between Gaza and Israel. Times like these require analysis, not advocacy, because understanding the world honestly and clearly is the first step toward trying to improve it. That's where the Wilson Center excels. We strike a balance between interpreting what Aaron Miller calls the headlines and the trend lines that flow from the fast-breaking developments, and few places do headlines and trend lines merge as seamlessly, I, I guess that would be the word, or as uh, um, uh, relentlessly as the recent U.S. withdrawal from the JCPOA, which is the subject of today's conversation. Uh, last week, I personally testified before the House Foreign Affairs uh, Committee hours before President Trump announced our withdrawal. My views, you will not be surprised, were a bit different. Uh, here's a brief summary. One, keep the JCPOA. Whether you were for it or against it, it's the agreement we struck. And my view uh, was, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That was my first point. My second point was, there are merits to fixing it, not nixing it. And I am for, I'm still for, a side agreement among those who will agree to it, uh, and certainly Germany, France, and, and uh, the UK want to agree to it with us. Third, uh, the notion that some in the Obama administration had that this deal would be transformational, not just transactional, as uh, Rob Litvak points out it was, uh, has failed. Uh, transformation did not occur uh, Iran's malign behavior is increasing and needs to be confronted and should be confronted. And by the way, I thought today the sanctions on the, um, uh, the, the bank uh, president in Iran were appropriate. Uh, the Trump administration, uh, I think, imposed them yesterday. Uh, number four, uh, I think there's linkage, um, some may not, but between uh, what happened with the JCPOA and the deal the Trump administration is trying to strike with North Korea. There's no doubt that Kim Jong-un was watching this carefully <coughs> and possibly concluding that if we withdraw from deals we make, uh, what might happen to the deal we might make with him. True, this is a agreement, not a treaty. It's not clear what could happen with North Korea. Um, I think the odds are reduced uh, based on recent behavior, but it's not clear that that wouldn't be an agreement, not a treaty as well. So he's watching closely and there is linkage. And five, um, I think the United States risks isolation. In my role here, uh, uh, this place, by the way, is voted by our peers as the best think tank in the world for regional expertise. Um, I get to see uh, foreign issues through a strategic lens. I think we've lacked a strategy uh, here for, uh, in the Middle East for a long time, uh, over several presidencies, not just this one. Uh, but I think that withdrawing from the JCPOA in the way that we have, uh, imposing, if we do, secondary sanctions on our European friends, imposing, if we do, uh, tariffs on steel and aluminum on our European friends, uh, the recent uh, decision uh, announced by tweet by the President on uh, 
sanctions against one Chinese company and so forth uh, risk causing a lot of people uh, to see us as someone they don't want to do business with. And that's a huge risk. The world is connected, uh, and we need a better, in my view, and I would have said this in the Obama administration too, uh, explanation uh, for what we view it as, our, uh, wor as our role in the world. Um, and if others conclude that they can do better business elsewhere, I think the consequences uh, for us are huge. So uh, let me just say that the panelists here are all the smartest we can field. Of course they are. Our moderator is the one and only Aaron uh, David Miller, who uh, worked for six secretaries of state and, and heads our uh, Middle East program and is our vice president for new initiatives. And before turning the program over to Aaron, I said I would do a public service announcement, which is that I think it's our 117th ground truth briefing, but who's counting? Th these are telephonic conferences, uh, will occur this Friday. And the topic is uh, today's bleak prospects for, <laughs> that's very nice, Aaron, for Israeli-Palestinian peace, a conversation with Saab Arakat and, and Gilad Sher, both dear friends of ours and I'm sure friends of yours. So that will take place on Friday at 10 o'clock, and you can get details on our website, and please tune in. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to uh, Aaron Miller. Uh, and uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge Hollis Fendiari. I hope she's here. If she isn't, uh, where is she? Um, the inestimable Hollis Fendiari, mm -hmm. former director of the Middle East program at the Wilson Center and a, a truly a, a, not only a treasure for the Wilson Center, but a, a national asset. Hollis, it's great to see you. Uh, so let me welcome you all again to the Wilson Center, the living memorial to our 28th president, our only PhD president, Woodrow Wilson, and the only one who has the distinction of being buried um, in Washington, D.C., which speaks volumes about the nature and relationships of presidents um, with, uh, with the nation's capital. And let me all welcome you to a post-joint uh, comprehensive plan of action world. Uh, I thought for some time that this flawed but still highly functional agreement uh, might not uh, endure in an administration that tended to see many of America's foreign policy interests, first through the lens of domestic politics and the JCPOA, functional though it may be, was never uh, popular, clearly, politically, in either party. Nor, have, as I've argued, is the JCPOA a religious experience or a Major League Baseball game. It cannot, it cannot be saved. It cannot be saved. And the, the question, if that is in fact the case, then the real question is, uh, with all due respect to my friend Rob Malley, who heads the International Crisis Group, they've done a lot of work on JCPOA minus. Is it possible that this agreement can be in fact sustained without the active commitment um, and support of the United States? I mean, I'm an, I have an open mind on this. Uh, we, we will see. But if it can't be sustained, and if in fact it kind of goes the way of the dodo, what does it mean for what does it mean for U.S. policy, our transatlantic relationships with our allies, our relationships with the Russians and the Chinese, our relationship um, or a non-relationship with uh, with Iran, and the whole question, which I know Tammy Wittes is focused on, on regional stability, and I. I I say this a lot with respect to Wilson Pat Center panels, but I cannot imagine four, in this case, better individuals with authority experience in government and longtime observers of the Middle East and, and uh, of U.S. policy to comment on these issues. I'm going to introduce each of them briefly. House rules uh, today will be uh, five minutes of opening remarks. I'll ask probably an annoying question or two. And then we will go to your questions. We're due to conclude at, uh, at 2.30. So to my left is Mike Singh, the Managing Director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy since March 2011. Um, Mike was a fellow at Harvard's JFK School of Government uh, and at the Washington Institute. He has served as Senior Director for Middle East Affairs at the NSC 
and as a special assistant to um, Secretary of State under uh, Bush 43. To his left is uh, uh, Tammy Wittes, Senior Fellow, Center for Middle East Policy at Brookings. Uh, she directed the center from March 2012 through March 2017. Prior to that, she was a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs at State Department from November 2009 until January 2012, focusing on coordinating U.S. policy and democracy and uh, human rights. Um, Tammy is also the co-host of Rational Security, a weekly podcast on foreign policy and national security issues, and she writes broadly on U.S. Middle East policy, regional conflict, and conflict resolutions. She was one of the first recipients of the Rabin Paris Peace Award established by President Bill Clinton in 1997. To Tammy's left is uh, my colleague, uh, the inestimable uh, Rob Litvak, Senior Vice President and Director of International Security Studies here. Rob's a consultant uh, to the Los Alamos National Laboratory. He served at the NSC as Staff Director on Nonproliferation during the first Clinton administration. He's been an adjunct professor in Security Studies program at Georgetown School of Foreign Service, Harvard, uh, um, the Russian Academy, um, of Sciences in Oxford. Uh, he's also a member of CFO, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations. And finally, certainly last but not least, is my friend and colleague, long time, Ray Take. Ray is the Hasib uh, J. Sabah Senior Fellow for Middle East Studies at CFR. Previously, he was a senior advisor on Iran, both at the State Department, fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, a professor at the National War College and professor and director at, uh, of Near East Studies uh, at the National Defense University. Ray, as you know, has written extensively on Iran and U.S. policy toward the Middle East. He's testified before various co uh, committees and he's appeared on numerous media, media outlets, including PBS NewsHour. So, with all that, uh, please turn off your cell phones. Uh, with all that taken care of, Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Aaron. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be up here with my co-panelists. Also, always an honor to, to share the room with uh, Hale, although I'm always a bit sheepish to talk about Iran with Hale Esfandiari in the room because she knows far more than I do about it. Um, I, I just want to give you a, a quick sense of where I'm coming from on this issue and then talk about three things um, very briefly. One, what happened, uh, the decision the president made. Two, the implications. Three, the road ahead. Um, where I'm coming from, I was involved at the outset of the P5 plus one nuclear negotiations, um, and we at that time set up a dual track approach of pressure and diplomacy. Um, so I've always been in favor of a diplomatic agreement uh, on this issue, uh, although I was a critic of the JCPOA in 2015 when it came out, um, because I believe then and I, I still believe now that it had certain flaws. Uh, in late 2016, I wrote um, a proposal essentially for uh, a method of quote unquote fixing the JCPOA through an agreement with our three European partners in the P5 plus one. Um, the Trump administration obviously uh, pursued that approach for a while and then set it aside, uh, and we are where we are now. Um, what exactly happened? You know, the, um, I, I believe that the president's decision to abandon the JCPOA and abandon the USC3 talks um, had both political roots, which I won't go into further because I'm not an expert as well as substantive roots. There was a view um, amongst uh, many here in Washington, I would say most Republicans certainly, including um, members of Congress as well as presidential candidates in 2016, that the JCPOA was, was flawed, was not a sufficient um, agreement to uh, restrict Iran's nuclear program. And I would say beyond that, there was a view that Iran's um, economy today um, was vulnerable and that Iran was also politically vulnerable at this time. I mean, so at a moment when we were dissatisfied with the JCPOA, perhaps reaching for tools to counter Iran and saw a vulnerability in Iran, um, I, I think all those things together added up to this decision. Um, I think also the, the administration believes um, that it has struck upon a model, as it were, in its approach to North Korea, the so-called maximum pressure model. Uh, and I do think that that will be the model that the administration tries now to follow, um, generating maximum pressure against Iran, not with, with necessarily the goal of bringing down the regime, but with the goal of a new diplomatic discussion, a new agreement. And the president has um, spoken of this explicitly. Now, implications. Um, what, what will now happen? Look, I think that um, 
when we put together the sanctions campaign against Iran in the mid-2000s, and then as the Obama administration continued, um, there was a heavy diplomatic element to what we did that is often not as well understood as the sort of market-based sanctions element, um, which is often talked about today. Um, we had the benefit of uh, a number of UN Security Council resolutions, um, which took a lot of work. Um, they took time as well as sort of dilution of some of our other efforts to get Russia and China on board, but they proved a very useful springboard for the other ad hoc, multilateral, financial, uh, and other types of sanctions, which ultimately were the more powerful. Um, we had tactical disagreements with our partners in Europe, Asia, and elsewhere, but I would say a strategic convergence with those partners. Um, that was partly the result of an enormous investment in diplomacy. I would see my British, French, and German counterparts on a weekly basis at that time. Um, now, we do not have a strategic convergence. I would say we have a strategic divergence, um, where we simply do not share uh, the same basis for this policy with our allies. We don't have a common assessment of the threat. We don't have a common view of the way forward. We're not going to get UN Security Council resolutions, as we got, for example, on North Korea as part of the maximum pressure campaign, because certainly Russia and China, at the very least, won't be on board. Uh, I think what the European allies um, have said and will say is that we essentially abandoned two U.S. initiatives. The JCPOA, they see as a U.S. initiative because it was largely bilaterally negotiated between the United States and Iran. Um, and they see the U.S. E3 talks as a U.S. initiative as well. Um, and so not only will they be upset, but I think they will be struggling, striving to preserve the JCPOA in some way, shape, or form. And I, I do think that that's possible. We can elaborate that on, on that maybe a bit later. I, I'm not sure it'll be nearly um, uh, what it was, but I think some rump form of it may survive. So I, I think that the going will be harder this time in terms of generating that sort of pressure on Iran that we have generated in the past. Certainly multinational firms will go along because faced with the prospect of loss of access to the U.S. market, they have a really easy decision. But the real question is translating that pressure into policy outcomes. That's hard on North Korea. I think it's hard in this context uh, as well. And in North Korea, the North Korean context, we do have that strategic alignment with allies. This is actually going to be the first time that we've tried to build this sort of secondary sanctions regime without that kind of strategic alignment with allies. Um, so I really see uh, three kind of steps going forward, three needs going forward, let's say. The first is really to heal that rift, to close that gap that we have with our closest allies, because anything we might hope to do against Iran will be much more effective if we're coming at it uh, from a unified point of view with our allies, if we have that common diplomatic foundation, which right now is absent. And so I would advise the administration to use the 90 to 180 day wind, uh, wind down period, I almost said wind up, wind down periods for sanctions to try to continue to try to reach a USC3 agreement. Now, that might not be the same kind of agreement it was in the past. Maybe it's something that's more like a diplomatic roadmap uh, of the sort that President Macron of France suggested when he was here. Um, but doing something to get back on a common basis with those allies will put us in a much better position vis-a-vis -vis Iran, and it's frankly a much likelier prospect than a kind of Hail Mary pass uh, to do a big deal with the Iranians in, in short order in any case. Um, second, I do think we need to nest our JCPOA decision in a more comprehensive Iran strategy so that this isn't just about sanctions. Look, while we've been debating the JCPOA for the last, I don't know how many years now, it feels uh, in, interminable, frankly, <coughs> but it's, uh, I think, three or four years. Um, Iran has pressed into Syria, uh, Iraq, Lebanon, Yemen. Um, facts have been changing on the ground, and we've really done nothing about it. Um, getting out of the JCPOA, whether you like it or not, does open up um, different policy avenues for us in terms of sanctions. The question is, what do we want to do? What are our objectives? What is the plan to do it? And then what diplomatic uh, and other types of tools and support do we need to do it? I think, at least internally, we need to lay that out, um, and then there's going to be some external aspects of that as well. Sanctions alone are not going to contain Iran or roll back Iran in the Middle East. And then third, we're going to need a diplomatic roadshow to explain this to all of our allies. U ultimately, sanctions enforcement um, even if that's all we really do, and to me that's not enough, that, as I just mentioned, we need a comprehensive strategy, still is an intensive diplomatic task. Um, we don't want to undermine our allies' security. We don't want to undermine our allies' economy. And if you look at the states that are importing oil from Iran, it's states like Turkey, South, South Korea, Japan, 
India is the second largest importer of Iran uh, of oil from Iran, um, and that's a state which is pivotal to our Indo-Pacific strategy that the administration has been talking about a lot lately. Even China, uh, I think you can see in this business with ZTE that we'll have difficult policy trade-offs with China. Are we going to sanction them for importing Iranian oil if they don't reduce their imports, or are we going to prioritize the trade issues, North Korea, and so forth? Each one of these things requires intensive consultations. It requires its own sort of sub-strategy within the umbrella of that Iran strategy. Um, and that would be the sort of third major task, I think, for the administration. Thanks. Great. Michael, thank you. Uh, Tammy? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Jane. Hala, it's so wonderful to see you. I think when I first started in this business almost 20 years ago, Hala was one of the first people to welcome me into the field of Middle East policy, and it's it's great to see you. Um, so I think Mike just laid out a lot of really worthy considerations uh, for the Trump administration in building what would be an effective uh, Iran containment strategy, an effective strategy to try and constrain Iranian nuclear development. Uh, the problem is that we're not living in a world <laughs> where uh, the president um, makes a decision with a clear strategic goal in mind and a structure set up to implement toward that goal. President Trump made this decision in the way that he's made a number of other key decisions in his presidency, the travel ban, the Jerusalem embassy move, uh, even Obamacare. These are campaign promises. He made these decisions based on domestic politics, his desire to fulfill those promises, and that's legitimate. He got elected president. That's what he gets to do. Um, but in making each of these decisions, he did it basically heedless of the policy context or the policy consequences, solely focused on checking that domestic politics box. And in each case, we've seen his advisors and his cabinet officials hastily have to backfill a policy around this decision which is made in a narrow and isolated context. And God bless Mike, he's, he's trying to help out with that effort. Um, what I'm going to do is try and put uh, these, uh, this decision in the context of the geopolitics of the Middle East, because this decision uh, comes at a particularly unpropitious moment for the region and particularly for American partners in the region. And it sends messages to them, I think, that are quite contrary to the messages President Trump might have anticipated when he was contemplating making this choice. Um, so look, let me begin by acknowledging that Iran's assertive behavior, its expansion of presence and influence across the region, um, these are not an artifact of the JCPOA. Uh, these are, to a certain extent, inherent in the nature, ideological, political, economic, of the Islamic Republic. Um, but we have certainly seen an escalation and an expansion of that Iranian behavior and of Iranian gains in the years since 2011, uh, since the Arab uprisings, uh, because the opportunities for that expansion of influence have proliferated significantly. Now, I don't think the Arab uprisings created those opportunities. I think that the reactions of Arab governments and Arab leaders helped to create those opportunities. Uh, and the breakdown of regional order as, the, as uh, the result of the collapse of several states and the emergence of civil wars created those opportunities. And the Islamic Republic has always been very good at exploiting those opportunities, and it was good in this context as well. Um, so, but I think it's, it's important to start with that context because what we have in the Middle East today is really an all-out competition between Iran and its proxies and allies on the one side and, uh, and its adversaries who are primarily the Sunni Arab states of the Gulf, Egypt, and Israel on the other side, an all-out competition for influence and for the, the determination of the future balance of power and the future shape of the Middle East, because the regional order was thrown up into the air in 2011, and it still hasn't settled. That's what they're fighting over right now. What that means is that the stakes for Iran and the stakes for its adversaries are much, much higher than they were when President Obama began to negotiate the JCPOA, than, than they were when the JCPOA was completed. Uh, and, and they're 
they are existential stakes from the perspectives of these regional actors. Um, now, unfortunately, for all these guys in the region, both friends and adversaries of the United States, this all-out competition is coming at a moment when the U.S. government, relatively speaking, is less interested in the Middle East than it's been in a long time compared to other regions of the world. Um, and that's because, number one, we are winding down years of uh, quite ramped up military presence in the region as a result of wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and then the fight against ISIS. Obama tried to ramp that down and had to go back into Iraq as a result of ISIS. Trump wants to continue that policy. One of the few consistent elements of Trump's attitude toward global affairs that you can see dating back to the 1980s is his mistrust of foreign deployments of American troops. He doesn't like it in Europe. He doesn't like it in East Asia, Japan, or the Korean Peninsula. And he doesn't like it in the Middle East. And when he signaled that he wanted US troops home quickly from Syria, it's part of that overarching attitude for him. Um, so in many ways, that's a continuation of a general uh, pulling back from the Middle East that started under President Obama. And it's something that the American public, by and large, supports and wants. Um, and I think we've seen that across several elections now. Uh, secondly, shifts in global energy markets mean that global supplies are up. The Middle East is relatively less important. Yes, it is still important, especially to specific countries, as Mike was noting. Uh, but prices are down, and Middle Eastern oil matters less to the global economy than it has in a long time. That has an impact on American interests. And finally, of course, there are the risks and opportunities in East Asia, and we see President Trump pursuing those assertively in his own special way. Uh, and we'll see how that works out. But again, this was something that shaped President Obama's policy and is shaping President Trump's policy. And from the perspective of partners in the Middle East, uh, a relative emphasis on Asia is a relative turning away from them, and they feel that. So in that context, uh, you can perhaps understand why, from the perspective of regional partners of the US, um, the message of President Trump's withdrawal from the JCPOA is not a message of reassurance. Now, a number of regional governments and important partners of the US welcomed this. They always opposed the deal. They always mistrusted the deal. In the case of Saudi Arabia, they supported the deal, but with a lot of reservations. Um, but their primary concerns uh, have not been about the nuclear program itself, with the exception of Israel. Um, their primary concerns have been these other dimensions of Iranian policy that were not constrained by the JCPOA. Uh, and so the message that was sent by this withdrawal is, on the one hand, relief. OK, we didn't think this thing was so great, and now it's gone. But they don't see it as presaging any grand strategy on the part of the Trump administration to really bear down on the Iranians and constrain those dimensions of Iranian policy that most trouble them. Quite to the contrary, all the signals that have been sent in the months leading up to this decision suggest a Trump administration that doesn't want any more to do with the Middle East <coughs> now than it did a year ago. It wants to bring troops home from Syria. It wants to leave the Iraqis to their own devices. It is not ready to wade in more deeply in the war in Yemen. Uh, and so I think a number of uh, US allies in the region are feeling today uh, kind of the way Donald Tusk uh, was feeling when he wrote on Twitter this morning about Trump and Europe's allies, uh, he said that Trump's message to Europe is, if you're looking for a helping hand, you'll find one at the end of your own wrist. <laughs> and I'll leave it there. Tammy, thanks so much. Rob, over to you. Well, thank you, Aaron. And uh, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, Halas Vandiari, who has ran our Middle East program. And my field is nuclear nonproliferation, or we hope is nonproliferation. And I've been a consumer of the wonderful regional work done at the Wilson Center, as Jane mentioned, the center was ranked number one in the world in regional studies. So we have a rich kind of uh, a series of meetings on these hard case countries, including from our Korea Center on, on, on the North Korean case. Let me begin with the caveat uh, 
and it is a pleasure to be on the panel with these distinguished, uh, uh, this distinguished group. Thank you. Uh, um, let me begin with a caveat that I'm speaking in a personal capacity, not as a representative of the Wilson Center, uh, which is a nonpartisan institution that promotes open dialogue, such as today's meeting, mm -hmm. uh, but does not take policy positions. Um, last week's announcement on Iran <coughs> was the most consequential foreign policy decision of the Trump administration. And if I can just make a general comment relating to U.S. foreign policy, it marked a departure from America's grand strategy. Uh, that winning strategy has been to promote U.S. interests by channeling American power through international institutions. Those institutions forged after World War II and with a lineage that can be traced back to Wilson, and we're centers celebrating its 50th anniversary and the 100th centenary of Wilson's big decisions. All of those institutions have a made in America stamp on them, uh, what we euphemistically call the rules-based international order. Now, the United States has walked away from an international agreement to which all the major, or the world's major party powers are party, and that was codified by the UN Security Council. And in addition, the International Atomic Energy Agency has found that Iran was in compliance with its obligations under the JCPOA. So far, Iran is playing it smart. Foreign Minister Zarif has been on, on a tour to various capitals to indicate Iran's going to stay in the deal, as, and the other parties to the JCPOA have so far indicated they're, they're st staying in. The goal here is to capitalize on Washington's isolation, uh, to make America, not Iran, the issue in international relations. And the the danger is that America first could morph into kind of America alone, and I'm not confident that this rift uh, created by the American decision is going to be uh, bridged or healed anytime soon. Before turning to the, today's topic, the implications of the U.S. withdrawal, just a word about the JCPOA, what it was and what it wasn't. And Jane mentioned in her introduction that the JCPOA was a deal, not a grand bargain, uh, to use the traditional dichotomy in public policy analysis. It was transactional, it was not transformational. That is, it focused narrowly on the discrete nuclear issue, but not it did not address all aspects of uh, Iran's objectionable behavior. But this is a new context for this debate, but it's a traditional one. During the Cold War, we debated whether arms control with the Soviet Union should be linked to broader Soviet conduct. And in the end, there was a pragmatic decision that the United States would pursue arms control agreements to constrain Soviet capabilities that were in the American interest, even though they were meddling in, in Angola or Vietnam or whatever. So there's a bit of a historical resonance with that. The JCPOA <coughs> constrains Iran's uranium enrichment program uh, to keep a latent nuclear capability latent. Uh, it buys time, which is, as they say in Brooklyn, not nothing in the world of, of nonproliferation. It denies uh, Iran access to weapons usable nuclear material. Uh, weapons usable nuclear material is what Stephen Hadley, Michael's old boss, called the long pole in the tent, because uh, that's the key technological component that that's states seeking to acquire nuclear weapons really need to make it happen. This is, after all, the technology of Glenn Miller and slide rules, okay? So it's not an esoteric technology. The constraint has been access to weapons usable material. Iran's nuclear program which can be traced back to the Shah's era, so it's 40 years old, is um, determined and incremental. But it's not a crash program to get a nuclear weapon as fast as possible. If you're looking at a crash program, look at North Korea last year. Two nuclear weapons tests, including a high yield weapon, 20 plus uh, ballistic missile tests to acquire the capability to target the U.S. homeland with a nuclear weapon. That's what a crash program looks like, and I think it does beg the question whether the current pivot to diplomacy is a reflection that they wish to kind of lock in uh, that, that status quo, new status quo, the North Koreans, that is. Iran, by contrast, I mean, those who've looked at Iran's uh, nuclear policies, they see their, the, it's not a crash program to get a weapon. It's more the desire to maintain a hedge option, the, the hedge that's inherent in its ability to kind of enrich uranium. In prior episodes, uh, when the Trump administration faced the decision to continue to abide by the JCPOA or not, uh, uh, it had to, dis had to continue waiving U.S. sanctions, et cetera. Uh, the formulation that they used was that Iran was abiding by the letter, but not the spirit of the agreement. Now, the letter of the deal was the deal. 
you know, within the four corners of the JCPOA, its obligations that the IAA found Iran to be in compliance with. The spirit of the deal is everything outside the four corners of the deal with respect to their uh, human rights records, their objectionable, uh, um, uh, destabilizing and aggressive uh, regional role, et cetera. Um, there was a fix, um, I think along the lines of some of the things Michael was just, you know, alluding to, of how you could improve upon technical aspects of the deal, didn't address ballistic missiles. Uh, there's the question of the sunset provision. Uh, President Macron came to Washington as part of the European uh, consortium to, to help bridge the gap there. That was uh, rejected uh, by the administration uh, in the lead up to the announcement decision. Um, uh, the, the Trump administration also should be noted has revived the term rogue state. And it's not some fetishism about language, but rather the term has the connotation of essentially a state beyond the pale, um, uh, carries the, 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 that connotation, and, and that, the, 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 that the crux of the, of the issue with, with Iran is not its objectionable behavior, but rather the character of the regime, because the behavior is inextricably linked to the character of the regime. So what it, that, that revival has really put in play whether the administration's objective is behavior change or regime change. I just sort of put a, you know, m mention that because I think it's a re term of reference in, in, in our debate now and accounts for part of the mixed messaging of the, of the administration. So finally, turning to implications, I guess it would, the header I just wrote down was in the mortar, in the mortar words of Boris uh, Johnson, what's plan B? Um, <coughs> Uh, start with the destabilizing regional conduct, and we have regional experts on the panel. I'm not, that's not my, my uh, for, you know, forte. I'm a consumer of the literature, but as, as, as a consumer of it, I just ask the question, how does any of that get easier to address in the absence of the JCPOA? And I don't see the rift created by this decision makes it any easier to bridge what everyone would acknowledge was the missing component in U.S. policy, which was the absence of a really coherent containment strategy toward, toward uh, Iran. Second, um, the Europeans. Uh, the Trump administration's uh, theory of the case, as the lawyers would say, is that we can ramp up maximum pressure to get a better deal, which would include aspects that weren't in the JCPOA. But that entails not inducing the Europeans to tend to their own interests, but rather coercing them uh, into complying with an American position uh, through the set of threat of secondary sanctions, uh, which uh, are very problematic in, in international law because of their extraterritorial nature. And it runs the risk of precipitating a trade uh, war, potentially, you know, with the Europeans if, if things get really kind of rough and the administration doesn't, uh, doesn't waive a lot of uh, European activities. And finally, uh, thirdly, with Iran, um, I've been kind of reading what the Iran watchers have said about, the, about this, and uh, there's a line of uh, argumentation that the, that the decision strengthens the hardliners. It, it reinforces their narrative that you can't trust the U.S., and it gives the hardliners uh, the ability to deflect criticism that whatever economic hardships are to come, which probably t relate to their economic mismanagement, um, can be blamed on the United States. And it really defers a debate in Iran that seemed to be happening over whether uh, Iran would continue to pay the costs for this assertive regional policy in blood and treasure. And, and that was a contentious issue in Iran. And then the last element of the Iran piece is they get a move too. All right, what if they withdraw from the treaty, from, from the agreement, and begin uh, to uh, re revert back to kind of industrial scale uranium enrichment? What's the plan B? Um, I think it would revive the military option and a strike on Iran's nuclear infrastructure, quite apart from the fact that they probably would reconstitute it in, in a reasonably short order, uh, runs a, a real risk of escalating into a broader con uh, conflict. Lastly, North Korea. Um, the, North, the JCPOA was termed the worst deal in history. Uh, that sets a high bar for North Korea, and we're seeing that play out today, uh, that the JCPOA, ironically, and, uh, and Washington does not do irony very well, uh, had, you know, was the, uh, offered a potential of a precedent that could be used for constraining North Korea's capabilities, not rolling it back, but just slowing the curve and, and, and stopping the continued uh, development, and, and, and uh, both in quantity and, and quality. But the Trump administration has rejected a transactional approach to North Korea. And transformation ain't on the table with North Korea. 
because after the U.S.-led regime takedowns in, in, in Iraq and Libya, zero's not on the table with the Kim family. They can mouth denuclearization in the way the United States is committed to global nuclear disarmament under Article 6 of the NPT. But when it gets to a meeting in Singapore, uh, it's going to be hard negotiating, and we'll be, we'd be fortunate if we could come out with a JCPOA-type deal that would block North Korea or constrain North Korean capabilities, particularly in, a, in, in, in their ability, gaining the ability to target the United States, uh, the U.S. homeland, with, with a, a nuclear weapon. I'll Rob, end there. thanks. Terrific. Uh, Ray, over thanks. to you. Uh, I'll try to offer uh, – Lessons learned, what went wrong, a sort of autopsy, uh, since I think obituary is too strong of a word, uh, uh, for the JCPOA. Um, because I do anticipate, actually, at some point to be U.S.-Iran negotiations again. And the JCPOA does have a lot of distinction, and one of them is, is the shortest duration of an arms control agreement that the United States left. The United States has left arms control agreements before SALT II in 1986, mm -hmm. so that was seven years. ABM in 2002, so that was about 30 years. <laughs> uh, agreed framework, I suppose that was about 20 years or so, 19, well, actually six, seven, eight years. Uh, JCPOA lasted two and a half years, uh, and, and I think there are lessons to be learned from that short duration. Uh, and there's few of them that I'd like to highlight. Uh, number one, if you want your arms control agreements to last, don't negotiate a particularly flawed one. Uh, to summarize the flaws of the JCPOA, which are quite legion, uh, I would have to say that JCPOA was a contravention of decades of American arms control consensus going back to mid-1960s when the United States developed an arms control policy with the Gilpatrick Report. It was at that time suggested that the United States would be against proliferation of dangerous technologies, which were identified as ability to enrich uranium and process plutonium. Uh, that standard had attenuated over the years, Japan, Brazil, so on. The JCPOA was the first occasion where the United States conceded an enrichment capacity to an adversarial country. Uh, and then it stipulated that that capacity would be industrialized. And then it stipulated that that industrialization could take place with uh, most cutting edge technologies. Uh, that, so it is a, it, 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 the proponents of JCPOA were correct. It was a landmark agreement uh, in that particular term. Um, of all the flaws of the JCPOA, I think the one that disabled it the most was the fact that it was riddled with sunset clauses. Uh, because at the end of the day, not too many people understand what does it mean to have a rotor in IR-8. But everybody understands what it means to have restrictions evaporate. The JC period was like a mirage. Every day, different pieces of it would evaporate. Uh, and so when one thinks about arms control agreements with Iran again, uh, I, I think whatever restrictions are negotiated, they have to be permanent in nature. And that was essentially an approach that the United States had taken to arms control negotiations with Iran prior to the interim agreement, the joint plan of action. Um, so that, that, whatever restrictions you want to negotiate, you want to consider them to be permanent in nature. That's a high bar, but I'm just telling you what arms control agreement with the Islamic Republic can succeed given the competing audiences. Uh, there was a thesis born, to be fair, it's always, as Rob said, accompanied arms control conversation, that it is most simple to segregate arms control from other concerns. Uh, that didn't originate with the JCPOA, that, that predated it. Uh, but I think in practice, there is always an implicit connection between other issues of concern and the viability and longevity of an arms control agreement. And I will say that about the Soviet Union. I think SALT II was born and sustained in the context of detente. SALT II died in the context of Soviet aggression in areas that well, one have to consider peripheral to Soviet interests, Horn of Africa and finally invasion of Afghanistan. There is an implicit connection always, I think, uh, 
between arms control and other forms of behavior. Arms controllers like to deny that, and I understand why, because it's nice to have a sort of a green dis conversation about technical aspects of things, but politics has a way of intervening. Uh, there was always something surreal about the JCPOA negotiations because they seem sort of hermetically sealed from reality. Uh, the negotiators of 5 plus 1 would meet in various hotel rooms in Europe uh, while Iran was sort of rampaging across the Middle East. They would banter and bargain. And it was just something quite, <laughs> quite surreal about it. it was, uh, and, and, and the reality caught up to it. Uh, so I would say in general, uh, I think it's a point that's been made, arms control should be an aspect of your Iran policy, not the totality of it, uh, because that tends, to, uh, that, that, that tends to actually undermine that agreement if the regional behavior and other forms of behavior do not improve in a substantial way. Uh, uh, arms, uh, I, I think JCPOA has another dubious distinction. I think one of the most contentious agreements, uh, arms control agreements in annals of arms control history. Uh, I think Mike suggested it. Uh, every member of the Republican Party voted against it. Every presidential ca candidate of the Republican Party uh, came out against it. And the competition in the Republican caucus was who would tear it up first. Uh, I'll do it day one, I'll do it the day before. Uh, so that, that was the competition. Uh, so what, what went wrong there? Uh, uh, to some extent, I think, there are other people here that will know better than I, uh, the administration had a theory of the case. Namely, if you embed this agreement in international institutions and international structures, you would protect it from its domestic detractors. That as long as UN Security Council approved it and Europeans liked it, American hackers and uh, Americans would go along with it. Wrong. <laughs> so the agreement never had a domestic consensus. Uh, and it was uh, uh, the House, it must be said, the House of Representatives voted against it and 58 senators voted against it. Uh, and it was to some extent a spectacle in the summer of 2015. Uh, there was a bill whereby the Senate had to vote for it, had to consider it. The bill was a Corker, Cardin, Menendez, Kane. <coughs> and you had the situation where Tom Kane was filibustering the Tom Kane law twice. Uh, so. <laughs> You know, Tim Kaine. Oh, uh, so, it, there was, there was a, so what I would say is any agreement with Iran uh, would have to be a treaty. If you have an agreement that you consider as a treaty, then you have to negotiate with the opposition. Henry Kissinger never liked negotiating with Scoop Jackson on arms control ideas. Look at the record that the phone conversations, the names that Scoop Jackson was called but they had to consider his objections and his concerns because they needed some sort of domestic standing. The JCPOA was a political agreement. Uh, it was an executive agreement. It had international support, uh, but it did not have, did not have a domestic uh, legal standing. And so any agreement with Iran, in my opinion, has to be, uh, any, if you get to an agreement, has to have a uh, be presented as, 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 a, as a treaty because that actually involves negotiations between the administration and the opposition. And therefore, you have a more sturdy legal foundation for it uh, because when what one president can enact with an executive order, the other one can countermand with a tweet. Uh, so in that particular sense, I would argue that. Uh, this is a high bar. And it may be that this problem is not susceptible to diplomatic mediation. Uh, it may be that diplomatic mediation is a way of avoiding how to actually one has to deal with this problem or because it's a way of kind of thinking about it. But I would say if this is going to be a diplomatic path forward, and I do actually anticipate at some point uh, United States and Iran to have direct negotiations over this. Every administration, well, most American administrations have negotiated with Iran directly, Carter over hostages, Reagan over arms, uh, Bush and Obama over arms control. 
and Clinton and Bush one actually had indirect negotiations with Iran or attempted to do so. So I do think that every administration will have its nightmare realized negotiating with Iranians. Uh, and this may be the case here. And if you do, one of the things that the Trump administration should do is actually articulate its vision for what kind of a civilian nuclear program it thinks Iran is allowed to have. I don't think Bush administration ever really did that, and the Obama administration changed its perspective a number of occasions, but essentially have an articulated vision. Uh, uh, there are two kind of phrases that come up a lot that I'm not, I've always been dubious of, grand strategy and the rule-based liberal and national order. Uh, presidents don't do grand strategy, political scientists do. And how relevant are they? Uh, and rule-based in the national order, rule-based in the national order seem to have accommodated a lot of things. Vietnam War, <laughs> Iraq War, uh, those who created the rule-based liberal and the national order, Harriman, Atchison, McCloy, were just fine with the United States dropping, what was it, seven million tons of ordinances, bombs, on the countryside of Florida, of Vietnam. So rule-based in the national order can be flexible. And I'm not quite sure if the JCPOA is as much of a danger to it as, as people suggest, because I'm not even sure what it is. But at any rate, uh, it's an agreement. It's been abrogated. Um, there probably has to be another one. And I just try to highlight some of the things that you can do uh, in terms of negotiating one that may survive beyond uh, two and a half years. Ray, thank you. It's 2 o'clock. Um and I'll ask one question. I'll try to provoke and annoy, and then we can go to all of your questions. I mean, look, and it picks up on a point that Ray has raised. You have a Middle Eastern transition, uh, I would argue, a broken, angry, and dysfunctional region. There are no transformations. There are only transactions. I mean, that's the reality uh, for many different reasons. And that will probably prove to be the case with North Korea as well even though, as Mike Singh points out, the basic difference is North Korea has nukes, Iran, Iran doesn't. But Ray, you said twice, I counted, that it was your view that at some point the U.S. and Iran would somehow find a way to re-engage. Now, do you, and I'll ask the four of you, because it gets, cuts to the core of what the Trump administration approach really is. On one hand, Tammy pointed out that there's a high degree of risk aversion when it comes to confronting Iran in the region, I find it extraordinary, despite the combustible, volatile, fire and fury, locked and loaded rhetoric. There has not been maybe a handful of incidents, Mike may, may be able to comment on this, when the United States directly used its military power to attack Iranian surrogates in Syria. Otherwise, we seem to have steered clear. We, yeah, we enable the Saudis in Yemen. We protest mildly. The, uh, temporary hostage taking of a Lebanese prime minister. We obviously have deferred to the Iranians uh, to some degree uh, in Iraq. And in Syria, we basically have, for any number of reasons, steered clear in a very crowded battlefield. So it, I guess my question is, as succinctly as possible, do each of you believe that there is something that you could describe as an approach by this administration, new cast of characters, John Bolton, Mike Pompeo, um, toward Iran? And if not, then what then? I mean, is this the dog that didn't bark? Transatlantic alliance hasn't been fractured. The Iranians are not ramping up enrichment. There's been no war between Israel and Iran, and there may not be one. We're only one week out here. No, I know, <laughs> I know. And you gotta measure it, measure it in terms of a trend line, not a headline. Mm -hmm. But exactly what is it that the administration is trying to do? Mike, can we put, can I? Can sure, I no, I, first? I, I think the answer is no. We have not seen um, anything that approaches a comprehensive Iran or Middle East strategy, for that matter, which might be asking too much um, of any administration. Um, from the Trump administration. I wrote an article about this last week uh, in Foreign Affairs about the, uh, the need for a more comprehensive approach to Iran. Um, I, I, I agree with sort of the, 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 the big picture analysis that Tammy put out there. I, I think that um, what we have seen consistently from administration to administration uh, 
apart from a sort of brief heyday that the, the Middle East had, is um, a willingness to talk very tough on Iran, um, but a real reluctance to get dragged into the Middle East any more than we absolutely have to, um, for lots of different reasons, um, and, and Tammy, I think, nailed uh, the big ones. Um, we saw this, frankly, from the Reagan administration, which largely saw Iran, I think, through the lens of the Cold War uh, with the Soviets, and they worried about the Soviet army kind of coming across the mountains and seizing control of the oil fields, but not much else. Otherwise, basically wanted nothing to do with this issue, um, to the point where, you know, when our marine barracks were bombed in 1983 and we knew the Iranians did it, our response was to basically try as hard as we could to avoid doing anything about it. Um, we did have a military confrontation with the Iranians in the late 80s, but the Iranians really had to drag us into that confrontation, uh, as, uh, as many people here know. Um, so I think that there has been a reluctance to do this. Every administration has found itself trying to engage with the Iranians in hopes of finding a moderate uh, in Tehran, uh, in hopes of reaching some kind of sense of common interests and so forth. And frankly, that hasn't worked out well either. Um, this is, I think, fundamentally a revisionist state in Iran, which is engaged in the sort of gray zone conflict. Um, I spoke about this yesterday at CSIS, which we associate with Russia and China and others. And confronting it is going to require um, a commitment to the region, and it's going to require sort of reaching into the policy toolkit and using all of our policy tools from probably low-level sort of military engagement to diplomatic engagement uh, on the other end. Uh, and frankly, probably even more than anything else, is going to require engaging more broadly with the states in the region um, so that they are perhaps more, really, more resilient and better able to confront these challenges themselves, um, which is sort of the uh, ultimate objective, I think, for so many administrations. Yeah. But but no, we have not seen that yet. And I think we need to see it because, as I said, I just don't see sanctions alone as even approaching uh, a workable strategy. Thanks. Tammy. Yeah, so uh, I actually, I have to say, as I project out, and it's very, very hard to project out with with this administration, but it's hard for me to see right now what's the pathway by which the Trump administration and the Islamic Republic would end up sitting at a table together. Um, I, on Syria, you know, where the Obama administration was sitting there at the table along with Iran and, and Gulf partners and Europeans and others, um, you know, Trump wants Syria to be Putin's problem, not his problem, and he's being pretty disciplined about holding his own uh, – officials and advisors to account for that. He is not going to wade into some big diplomatic process over the future of Syria. So I don't think you'll see the, US, the Trump administration sitting at the table with Iran over Syria. Uh, Yemen, you know, if there's a, an outcome in Yemen where the U.S. has on and off played a mediating role, right now the Trump administration is letting the U.N. handle any mediation <coughs> in Yemen and deferring to Saudi preferences. Uh, and frankly, you know, if and when the Yemen war ends, it, it will be because the Saudis find a way to make it end. Um, so, you know, as I look around the region, it's hard for me to isolate. And, you know, we've talked about all the problems with reconstituting nuclear diplomacy. It's hard for me to isolate the instance where that diplomatic engagement is going to occur. Um, I, I think what we really see from the Trump administration is, you know, <laughs> I guess it was Barack Obama told Jeffrey Goldberg in The Atlantic that he thought Saudi Arabia and Iran needed to share the region. And this was <coughs> uh, so to the extent that he had a vision uh, for Iran's role in the region, it was that. And that was one that our Arab allies found infuriating and terrifying. Um, but I think Trump's message to uh, to the region is uh, self-help, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and go ahead, guys, do what you need to do to confront the Iranians. I'll, I'll see you when you're done. Let me know how it works out. And, um, and so I, I, I think the premise that there's some kind of American-Iranian engagement over stabilizing the Middle East, it, that's premised on the idea that the U.S. wants to be the stabilizer, wants to be the guarantor for security in this region. And while President Obama, despite all of his reticence and reluctance and his desire to prioritize other regions of the world, he was still willing to play that role to a certain extent. President Trump is not. He is not interested. And so in some ways, if we ended up there uh, with the US and Iran sitting at the table, that would in a way be an incredible victory for the Iranians. 
um, that they managed to drag this incredibly reluctant uh, president to the table with them. Yeah, it's extraordinary. We could do it with the last totalitarian. He's about to do it on June 12th, a guy whose human rights record is probably worse than all of the mullahs combined. Uh, uh, and yet we're not prepared or willing to do it with this guy, well, Rob. Pres President Trump tried to sit down with President Rouhani. That's right. Reports. Maybe Rouhani should have taken that meeting. Right. <laughs> yeah. Rob. Jane's got a two-finger there. Do you? No, no, I'll wait. I'm, I'm okay. Wait. Rob, um, I'm, I'm rushing you guys, but I yeah, want to I get mean, the Q&A with the audience. The Middle East uh, is an outlier region. I mean, it's got a GDP like the non-oil GDP like the size of Finland or something like that. I mean, it's 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 really an outlier in terms of what's going on there. And I don't know who came up with this formulation that, you know, uh, I, which I like. It's you know, in Iraq, the United States intervened, occupied, and it was a disaster. In Libya, we intervened, didn't occupy, it was a disaster. In Syria, we didn't intervene, we didn't occupy, it was a disaster. Um, it's, it's, other, it was it was know, it, it was Phil Gordon. We'll give him credit. Okay, uh, footnote noted. I did. I just I just I just <laughs> forgot who it was. But I think that's accurate. Which is, you know, it's like the end of Chinatown is a cinephile where where he says to Jake the, the Jack Nicholson character J.J. Giddies, Jake, this is Chinatown. We don't have a clue. Basically, we don't know the languages. We don't know the culture. Uh, it's not a question, you know, we, of, of, of being involved uh, there. Do I have confidence that this team in, in, in you know, in, in the White House is going to be able to manage these kinds of things? Uh, I think Tammy's, you know, I, I concur with, 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 with Tammy. The idea of the, of, the, of, of uh, and, and this is, a, it's a fair debate to have on whether things are linked or not, or whether they are, there's a tacit linkage that, that if, the, if the politics goes to hell, you can't sustain them. In the end, we may have not had a ratification of, start, of, of the follow-on SALT treaties when, when the Soviets had occupied Afghanistan, but we abided basically by the parameters that had been sort of set out. No one did, was looking for a strategic breakout, breakout there. I don't know, um, zero, I'm looking, I was writing up, what would a deal be? I mean, the Trump administration has sent essentially a transformational bar, zero enrichment, end of destabilizing activities in the region. It's a, it's, it's a long list. And on the, on the uranium enrichment, um, we lost that battle. 100 states plus met in, in uh, Tehran, and they agreed that with Iran, that under Article 4 of the NPT, Iran should be able to have a nuclear fuel cycle. We tried. Michael probably tried a lot when he was in the administration with colleagues to go for zero centrifuges. I, you know, I'm all in favor of it, but um, uh, it really comes down to the possibility. I mean, I'm a card-carrying pragma pragmatist on this, and we should do what we can do right. and not overreach. Okay. Ray, I know you're eager to uh, say something. No, I'm not a pragmatist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, as far as the Iran policy, they did actually do a review. It took them nine months to do it. And it was predicated on certain assumptions. Uh, and the Iran question sometimes is like the Irish question. You know, as soon as you figure out the answer, the Irish change the question. Uh, and and the, I think the review was predicated on internal stability in Iran, which is what the starting point of every review is, despite the turbulent history of the Islamic Republic. And the second, probably sustaining the JCPO or quote unquote fixing it. Uh, those assumptions turn out <laughs> not to be true. So now you have to do Maybe another review. I don't know. Uh, okay. Hopefully, this one won't take as long. Uh, I, I do think they should begin to articulate a, 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 some kind of vision about how they see uh, the nuclear aspect of the Iran policy. Uh, and maybe that be forthcoming at some point. I, I don't know. Uh, in terms of negotiations between the two, if the history of U.S. Iran relations is any indication, there are a ton of background messages coming. Uh, that's just the, when there's no official dialogue between the country, uh, there, is, uh, there is a lot of unofficial dialogue. When, as I said, when there's no track one, uh, there's probably about 17,000 track twos happening. Uh, and there's uh, messages coming back and forth about this and that. So I, I think I, well, you may not want to exercise those opportunities, but I do think at some point they have to be ready for the possibility of negotiations. Uh, which is kind of quite daunting because the Iranian strategy of negotiations, by the way, going back to, going back to, the, to the 20th century, uh, when they have been very effective at negotiating with Westerners, is by not making concessions and showing up at the table, the other side will always make concessions. And that has worked. Uh, that's worked actually for Mohammad Mossadegh. Uh, it has always worked. So they may actually show up to the table and not make concessions, and everybody will say, well, 
you know, United States should do this and that, and eventually the cascade of American concession opens up. Uh, so I do think at some point there may be a table in the future, and that's not something a future many should look forward to if they have to manage the table. Thank you. All right, Jane. I love this panel. <laughs> uh, the deep knowledge, the slight but civil disagreements, and the enormous humor. I mean, it's per perfection. Uh, thank you, Aaron. You've brought perfection to the Wilson Center. So um, nobody really talked about Israel. Why am I raising Israel? It is uh, uh, certainly uh, in the Trump White House a huge ally of ours. In the U.S. Congress, it is a huge ally of ours on a bipartisan basis. Just imagine that. And by creating more instability in the region in terms of uh, Iran possibly leaving the deal in the absence of a plan B, uh, then the existential threat that Israel thinks Iran poses to it increases. So my question is, uh, in the meantime, what about Israel? And uh, addendum to that, what if, I have no uh, knowledge that this would happen, but I have no knowledge that it wouldn't happen, what if the Saudis announced that they decided they need a bomb because Israel may have one, hmm, and Iran um, has, you know, <coughs> made the capacity, uh, and they buy a bomb from Pakistan? Okay. Let's – somebody want the Israel question? I can somebody do want it the quickly. Saudi I'm question? sure Mike has thoughts as well. But um, So, look, I think we've already seen, Jane, this sort of tit-for-tat uh, – in, in Syrian airspace primarily um, between Iran and Israel. What I've seen so far is very carefully calibrated messages on both sides, neither side looking for an escalation. Um, I was in Lebanon a week ago to observe the elections uh, where Hezbollah, of course, dominates the south with over 150,000 missiles of various capabilities pointed toward Israel, um, they are very worried about escalation, either intentional or unintentional. Uh, but so far, uh, both Iran and its regional opponents have chosen to kind of keep Lebanon out of their regional argument. Um, so, you know, I can say that there's no intention to escalate. That doesn't mean that it might not happen anyway. Sometimes messages get misread. Sometimes somebody uh, hits and makes a bigger uh, explosion than they intended. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes accidents happen. Uh, so I think there's lots of possibility there. The other question we face, of course, is uh, if Israel might choose in the wake of a JCPOA collapse, and let's remember it has not collapsed yet, uh, but if they see Iranian progress toward a bomb, will they go back to where they were uh, and contemplate their own preemptive action. Uh, Ehud Barak's memoir is just being released, and he had an excerpt out which is uh, strategically chosen. It is his discussion of the debates within the, the Netanyahu government uh, in which he participated as defense minister over whether to do that preemptive strike. He claims that he was in favor, uh, which I think is political positioning for a guy who wants to reenter the fray, and that tells you something about the Israeli mood. Yeah, just a footnote, uh, Netanyahu and Putin have met, I think, eight times over the last 18 months. And the Israelis, I think, understand that if there is a arsonist and a firefighter, both, they need to deal with the Russians on this one. Uh, Saudi. Mike, do you want to? Um, sure, I'm happy to. Just briefly. So, so I think that the Saudis have said a number of times publicly that if Iran were to obtain a nuclear weapon or, or go down that road, they too would obtain a nuclear weapon. Um, and I think that people in government largely take that seriously. Now, there's lots of obstacles, of course, for countries to obtain nuclear weapons. Um, thankfully, thankfully, we don't see this happening um, everywhere um, by any means. Uh, it's expensive. It comes with a lot of headaches in terms of uh, the international community um, wondering what you're up to and so forth. Um, but I think that it's, it basically seems true to me that for a state like Saudi Arabia, which has certainly the resources to pursue such a program, um, even if it wouldn't be easy, that it would take some significant change in the sort of geopolitical landscape. I, I don't think Israel comes into it. Um, Iran developing a nuclear weapon does, but there are other things that we'd need to think about as well. If the U.S. really significantly pulls back from this region to the point where our allies no longer feel as though we are 
backstopping them, um, perhaps that could result in more nuclear proliferation. Um, I think we have a similar kind of question right now in Northeast Asia about sort of if we were to, say, do a deal with North Korea that involves only the ICBMs, what does that do to the nuclear balance um, in Northeast Asia? How does that affect Japan's decision making and so forth? Um, the other question would be if you had other great powers coming into the region, um, which frankly would be a restoration of the norm for the Middle East, um, would that affect uh, the decision, the nuclear decision making of states like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and so on and so forth? Um, but I think, you know, look, right now I think it's, it, it, the statements are meant to shape U.S. decision makers' calculations. Uh, and they do, I think, shape U.S. decision makers' calculations. Okay. Uh, station identification briefly and a question. Yes. In, uh, yes. Uh huh. Hi, Jody Herman, uh, formerly with Senate Foreign Relations Committee. What if uh, what is the biggest headline here was the one that already happened, which is the U.S. pulls out of the JCPOA, and then really not a lot else follows that. So, what precipitated what the the movement on the sanctions regime when it was in place required massive multilateral engagement and a diplomatic effort on the U.S. part. Uh, in the if in the absence of that. Uh, multilateral compliance, the options under the sanctions regime are to actually go ahead and sanction all of our friends and allies and even some of our, even some folks who aren't necessarily our friends and allies like the Bank of China. <coughs> Realistically, when the, when, the, when the Congress put those sanctions in place, we recognized that what, what was required was us to be the bad cop and for everybody else to like use that and come along with us because there was real concern that really at the end of the day that no administration would go ahead and sanction, say, the Bank of England or the Bank of China. So what if, what if this just goes along as is, right? We pivot to North Korea, honestly, and in the absence of Iran doing something new, if Iran stays in the JCPOA, nothing else new really happens on that front, it's possible the U.S. just lever you know, imposes a couple of other sanctions against Iran like they did this week. Uh, against uh, against the head of the central bank, they might do some things on ballistic right. missiles. It's entirely possible that really nothing else happens. All right, will will the administration point. let this go? If you read the Treasury white paper, that doesn't appear to be the case. I mean, and and Mnuchin has intimated that there will be additional sanctions. Uh, who wants this one quickly? Uh, if you care about sanctions as a foreign policy tool. Uh, whether it's applied to Russia or narco-terrorism or whatever, not applying those sanctions for fear of transatlantic rift undermines the credibility of an important tool. So I think you have to go through, and, you know, it's a lot of European entities were sanctioned <coughs> during the early years because of transactions with Iran that were impermissible. So I do think that the United States doesn't, as far as I know, sanction countries, it sanctions companies. Uh, so I do think that if there are violations to preserve the credibility of this particular policy instrument, which is often used because it's more tolerable than the alternatives, uh, then I do think you have to risk that transatlantic rift and go ahead and impose those sanctions. Just, can I add one thing? Here? Yeah, sure. Just, just one thing to add here um, quickly is um, I point everyone back to the first term of the George W. Bush administration where there was a lot of concern about Iran. It was a member of the Axis of Evil. Everyone will remember that. Um, but one of the curious things about U.S. policy then is that we didn't actually do very much of anything about Iran. And, and I would say there were two reasons for that. One was there was an internal division within the administration over what to do. Um, you had some who I think were in favor of regime change, others who were uh, in favor of a different approach, a more sort of diplomatic containment type of approach. Second was obviously there was a, a tremendous preoccupation with a different problem at that time, and that was Iraq. Um, so certainly we see similar factors coming into play today, which is why I think for the Trump administration, they, they cannot be, if, if they're serious about this problem, and I think they have to be serious now having stepped out of the JCPOA, um, they cannot assume that the sanctions will somehow work by themselves. There's going to be a tremendous internal bureaucratic effort that is required to come up with a coherent policy and then actually enforce it and apply it. Um, where you'll really have to have all the principles on board and then sort of bureaucracy under that to make it happen. It's not going to happen by itself, um, even if the sanctions are market-based. Yes, right here in the middle. Yep. Hi, uh, Phil Schrafer, international health care worker, retired. Um, in the interest of our country being more owl-led than hawk or dove, shouldn't we have cognitive empathy? And that is 
if we're looking at the leadership in Iran, you've got a spiritual leader, Khamenei, that read the wolf book on, on Trump, uh, in Arabic, of course. You have Rouhani, who was an elected cleric, uh, who, who, uh, who taught in England. And you had Zarif, who got education in, in California. So it's, you need to look at you know, a more in-depth view of a country than just sort of Iran and, and, and so forth. Yeah, so does the Trump, I mean, well, I'll leave it at that. Does anybody want to address the issue of nuance and understanding in Washington with respect to um, internal Iranian politics and Western-oriented thinking of some of Iran's leaders quickly? Ray, I think maybe you. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, I would say that all countries, all political systems, including this one, uh, suffer or are characterized by factionalism. Uh, I would say the, Iran, the Islamic Republic has been most successful to offer its factionalism as an excuse for its conduct. Uh, you know, because we're factionalized, so we, you know, you have to essentially permit that. Uh, we're factionalized, uh, so I'm not quite sure to suggest that our diversity of opinions in a system is 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 a justification for absence of punitive action. Yeah, I just don't think you're going to get a lot of sympathetic understanding in the administration for um, Western educated or oriented Iranian leaders. Uh, at least it doesn't appear a year in. It doesn't appear that that's the case. Did no? Okay. Um, where are we? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, Brooke Bossigal, Independent. Uh, so what do you believe, if anything, could be produced out of continued negotiations with the Europeans toward Iran? Well, so uh, look, I, I think that we have to talk to the Europeans about Iran because we, we share some basic interests and objectives, even if we're, as I said, strategically divergent now. None of us want Iran to obtain a nuclear weapon. Um, none of us would be happy if the outcome of all this is Iran resuming its enrichment program, for example. Um, the Europeans, just like us, are concerned about Iran's uh, sort of reach into Syria, Yemen, and, and so on and so forth. Um, all The Europeans ultimately, I think, need the United States um, because of our weight in the region, because of our power in the world. Um, but we also really always prefer to act with allies, and you know, the, the European states, um, as lo along with some regional states, are really the most readily available allies that we have and the most willing to generally support us. So, so I don't think we have a choice but to talk to them about these problems. Um, the point is, to what end? Um, one end could be trying to still pursue that kind of US E3 fix that would preserve the JCPOA. That, to me, as, as Aaron said, seems unlikely, given how definitive the president was. So absent that, I think we need to be talking to them about what is the roadmap forward. Um, now, that won't be easy by any means, but I think you still have to do it. Try to come up with some common foundation for a transatlantic policy towards what is ultimately a shared threat, a shared interest. Rob? I think if, if the Europeans went to a, a relations therapist, they would say, date other people um, <laughs> in, in dealing with us. Um, uh, <coughs> you know, it's not just, it's just not what we did when you had uh, Macron and Merkel. And it, it, it was sort of the it was the in-your-face way it was done as well, okay? And so I don't know what the, 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 the uh, patience is in Europe of kind of re-engaging on this. Basically, the something that you could put under a fix-it rubric was what Macron kind of proposed, and, and that was um, uh, rejected. Just one other comment on the last thing about empathizing with the, with the Iranians. I mean, they're do, you know, unlike other parts of the Middle East, uh, as a non-regional expert kind of consuming the literature, it seems like there's actually some semblance of real politics in Iran and a division over whether they should be an ordinary state or a revolutionary you know, entity, as, as a former Iranian president did. And these sort of moderate, right, you know, uh, kind of uh, radical sort of you know, plays into that. And we should be thinking, if it is a real debate, sort of how we can, um, through our actions from the outside, kind of try to leverage in, in, in one way or the other. I would say that, that when I worked on the on the NSC, the National Security Council staff, um, you know, I was talking to a colleague, and he said, "Gee, if I lived next door to Saddam Hussein, I'd want nuclear weapons." And and uh, they'd been invaded by Iraq, they were been gassed by Iraq, and the international community turned a blind eye. Um, and uh, I think that 
that has to, I mean, the, what's striking is the program's 40 years old and then they're not closer actually to having a nuclear weapon. I think we have time for one last question. Yes, down here. Hi, um, my name is Kevin Killian. I'm an independent uh, citizen. I, I wanted to ask about uh, the proliferation thing and um, Mrs. Harmon said something about uh, Saudi Arabia, their last monarchy and um, why, w why would they, why would anybody give uh, Saudi Arabia a, a nuke when they, when, you know, monarchies fall, there might be a different government. And uh, the thing about uh, Israel having nukes, um, can you say something about that? Is there a possibility for nuclear free Middle East? Yeah, I mean, that one I'd take. I think the answer is 100% no, as long <laughs> as the Middle East continues to be the Middle East. And the Israelis obviously have said repeatedly, and Netanyahu was interviewed some time ago, I heard him on this, you know, Israel will not be the first state to introduce nuclear weapons into the region. But the estimates are pretty clear, that at least 200 deliverable nuclear weapons. So I, I, I think that's, the answer to that is no. On the issue of proliferation, why would anybody give the Saudis a nuclear weapon and or could they produce one uh, well, the, the, on their the own? Standard, the standard <laughs> answer, you know, kind of quip is that the Saudis will add a zero to the check to the Pakistanis and that's their program. But, uh, right. Uh, I think we've come to the end of the hour. I have to say I don't want to fall in love with my own product, but <laughs> I, I have to tell you, this is what happens when you put four extraordinarily gifted, talented, wise, and experienced people in the same room, all of whom can actually get along with one another. I, I think it's really remarkable. So please join me in thanking them for an outstanding panel. <laughs>